असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 ओ लीड अस फ्रॉम दि अनियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस एंड टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी ओम पीस 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 नमस्ते एंड वेलकम अनदर ब्रिलियंट डे हियर इन मैनहैटन टुडे द सब्जेक्ट इज पूर्णम इट्स अ संस्कृत वर्ड व्हिच मींस द द होल द फुल इनफिनिट लिमिटलेस दिस एक्चुअली फॉर्म्स अ पेयर with the uh, last sunday's talk which was uh, which was titled shunyam which means the void or emptiness so emptiness and fullness um in fact just a little correction from for last um, sunday's talk I, i mentioned a particular book progressive stages of meditation on emptiness and i said uh, i said somebody who had recommended it to me but it turns out somebody else had recommended and he wrote and no, no no it was me i i recommended it to you <laughs> so it was uh, uh jackson peterson who was a, a tibetan who is a tibetan buddhist master and teacher in this country and abroad also many places abroad so we are very grateful to him because that book really put a lot of things in place for me purnam why i selected this as Now, this is sort of for me this is a word which um, which encompasses the vision of vedanta in its entirety and its depth for me it is particularly evocative because when i was growing up a little boy in um in a city called bhubaneswar on the eastern coast of india we had a we have a very beautiful ramakrishna mission ashram there which was founded in all the way back in 1918 by swami brahmananda the first president of the ramakrishna order the whom sri ramakrishna considered his spiritual son beautiful ashram and very very deep spiritual vibrations there now as a little kid i still one of the memories of the ashram that i have is uh, going upstairs to the shrine the shrine was on the roof it still is but in the old shrine when you go up there this is about 40 years ago uh first you enter through a room you used to in those days and that room was a bare little room very sparse and um i could i can still feel the cool floor on, on my bare feet and the sunlight streaming through the open windows there's a very beautiful garden outside and very silent except for some sometimes you know chirping of birds and there was just this one uh mantra written on a wooden um board hung up on the wall that's all not there was nothing else in that room as far as i remember and that mantra said in sanskrit the famous shanti mantra from the upanishads ओम पूर्णमद पूर्णविद पूर्णा पूर्णमुदच्यते पूर्णस्य पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवावशिष्यते ओम शांति 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 व्हिच मींस ओम दैट इज द इन्फिनिट ब्राह्मण दैट मींस आई विल आई एक्सप्लेन दैट सो दैट इज द इन्फिनिट ब्राह्मण दिस दिस मैनिफेस्टेड यूनिवर्स इज आल्सो पूर्णम इज द इज दैट इज दैट इन्फिनिट ब्राह्मण इज ब्राह्मण and from that purnam this purnam has come from that fullness this fullness has arisen purnat purnam udachyate purnasya purnamadaya in this manifested universe if you recognize the infinite here then purnam eva avashishyate the infinity alone remains or the the fullness alone remains so the, what, what, if you put it together what does it say it says that is the full this is this universe is also the full and this fullness has come from that fullness and in this if you recognize the infinity 
then that fullness or that infinity alone remains. Om, peace, peace, peace. Now, I don't know how much I understood of that. I was a little kid. I knew some Sanskrit because we were studying it in school, so I was able to read it. But it was very evocative for me. I don't know if it's some kind of memories of past life or something, but I always was fascinated. I remember before going to the shrine, I would stop and stare and just soak in the sunlight and the stillness in that room and that mantra on the, on the wall. Um, that's why it's always remained my favorite uh, you know, peace chant, Shanti Mantra. Today, I want to go a little bit into it. it it's the, the deepest truth about Vedanta, about Hinduism. I think it's, it's really great to reflect upon it a little bit. Let's go into this, um, in the profound depths of this mantra a little bit before we go ahead. Purnamadaha Purnamidam. The Sanskrit the Sanskrit words ada idam. Ada means that. Something that is not perceptible. You don't see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. Uh, you, you can't um, comprehend it with your uh, intellect. You don't have any information about it. It's something that you take on belief. You know, for example, God. God is in heaven. I don't see God. Uh, I don't understand it quite too, not too well. Um, it's beyond my perception. Beyond creation, that. In Sanskrit, there's a word for it, paroksha. Paroksha means beyond the uh, beyond the range of our senses. It's uh, suprasensible. So that is full or infinity. That which is paroksha, beyond our range of our senses, which we take on belief. Maybe our religion has told us about it. Maybe um, you know we sort of believe in it, some kind of transcendent reality. And then it says, Purnamidam, this one, which we perceive right now, this world, this also is full. This is also full. Now, the, let, concentrate on the words idam and ada. Idam means this, perceptible universe, which we are experiencing all the time. Ada means that, transcendent, which we don't experience, and we sort of t either believe in it or don't believe it. In any case, even if you believe in it, you take it on faith. And now see what the mantra is doing. It's so subversive. It just says both that which is transcendent and that which is right now here empirically perceived and which you're experiencing all the time. They're the same thing. And by using the word Purnam, that's Purnam. This is Purnam. It's exactly the same thing. What, what, has, what has been done here is Paroksha and um, this Pratyaksha. Pratyaksha means direct. These two words are brought together and both are called Purnam. By that, what is done is, there's a Sanskrit word, Badhita, negated. The remoteness and the immediate perceptibility, both of them are negated by showing that it's one reality. Go a little further. If that sounds cryptic and difficult, it'll become easier. But it's, it, it is a very profound subject. If you go a little further, the next part of the mantra says, Purnat Purna Mudachyate. From that fullness, this fullness has arisen. If you want to put it in the language of theistic religion, God created the world. That's what is being said. God created the world. God created the world. From that fullness, this fullness has arisen. In the Sanskrit grammar of it, Purnat, that's the fifth case in ending. From that. Fifth case, always uh, from that means cause. A cause is being pointed out. And this is the effect. That is the creator. This is the created. And again the mantra does something sub um, subversive. It says that and this, that cause and this effect are both Purnam. They are not both. They are the same Purnam. By saying that what has been done, Causality is negated. <coughs> From that, this has been created. The mantra is saying, no, 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 nothing has been created. That alone exists. And we are experiencing it as this. But this Purnam, this limitless, this whole, that alone exists. There is no difference between cause and effect. See, this is very profound. Because in, um, in traditional theistic religion, dualistic religion, what is said? God is the cause, the creator, and this universe is the created. 
dualistic, dualistic in the sense of two different realities. So the cause is real. A dualistic religion will say, cause is real. There are dualistic schools of Vedanta, which will say the cause, God is real, and this manifested universe is also real. Two realities. And they're separate, the two realities. God has created a separate universe. It's not that they are the same. The non-dualist, the Advaitin, will ask here a question, is that, see, if that is real, nobody doubts that the creator, God, Brahman, is real, neither the dualist nor the non-dualist doubts. And both agree. There is some cause, Brahman, which is real, uh, some reality, Brahman, it's real. Now, the non-dualist asks this question, to the dualist, if that is real and something has come from that, something other than that has come, if something is other than reality, what does it, ha what happens to it? It becomes unreal, it becomes false. In fact, when, my dear dualist, when you claim that the world is a separate reality created by a creator God, it's equivalent to claiming the world is false because it's other than the real God which I and you, both of us, agree. Whereas, what the Advaitin says is that um, that Purnam and this Purnam, the cause Purnam and the effect Purnam, they're both one and the same. There is no cause and effect. This is the deepest conclusion which you find in texts like the Mandukya Karika, for example. Uh, negation of causality. There is apparent causality. And there is something which appears as this, because they look different, they are experienced differently. It's like um, the gold made into the ornaments, the clay made into the pot. Now you would say, clay has produced a pot. If you say, produced a pot, is there a pot apart from the clay? And you, if you look at the pot, it's clay and clay throughout. If you look at the golden ornament, it's gold and gold throughout. And the claim of this mantra is that if you examine this world, which appears to be a world of duality, of diversity, of continuous change, of ups and downs, of pleasure and pain, of life and death, if you actually examine, if we have eyes to see, we will see that absolute tr truth alone exists here. Satchidananda alone exists here. See, what I'm saying is this. Um, I remember asking this great Swami uh, who passed away several years ago, Swami Nirmuktanandaji. He was a disciple of Swami Shivananda. I believe he was spiritually a very advanced soul. Many of us did believe. So once I asked him that uh, he was sitting, if you have gone to Belurmat, the main monastery there on the bank of the Ganga, you've seen the temple of the Holy Mother, Ma Sharada. So he's sitting there and facing towards the temple of Swami Vivekananda. He was sitting there and he was at that time in his late 90s, so this Swami. I bowed down to him and I asked this question. So how does the enlightened one look upon this, you know, this world? Uh, is it that there is Brahman and you know, there existence, consciousness, bliss? And this world is like a kind of a shadow? You know? and then he thought for a moment and he said, no, why should that be? There is only one. This idea that there is a reality and there is a falsity. That there is a falsity. This comes, this kind of, this is still dualistic thinking. This comes from an analysis, you know. Here in this world of appearances, I am analy analyzing and finding out the reality. And so this world remains as an appearance. Reality and appearance. But they are not two. What he told me, why, why should that be? There is only one. And of course, I, I had to push. So I, <laughs> I asked him, all right. I didn't quite get what he was saying. All right, but is that how you are seeing this? I was trying, trying to find out, if, is he going to confirm that he's enlightened? <laughs> is that how you are seeing the world right now? Are you seeing this display right now you know, as one divine reality? And uh, he replied with another story. He said, there's another very great monk, Swami Buddhananda and Swami Jagadananda, the disciple of the Holy Mother. Jagadananda was regarded as a, an enlightened person in his own time. This was in the 1950s, probably. Um, so one day, this uh, Swami Buddhananda, who was in charge of a Ramakrishna mission in Delhi, he asked Swami Jagadananda apparently, Well, sir, people say you're enlightened. Are you enlightened? And the Swami replied, If I say yes, will you believe me? I immediately understood what the Swami was trying to tell me. And I bowed down to him and said, yes, sir, I've, un <laughs> I've understood, Swami. 
<laughs> so this is a question about the so if you're saying are you trying to say that this itself is brahman what we are experiencing it doesn't look like it there is this question about the reality of the world and the falsity of the world there are schools of vedanta which say the world is real there are schools of vedanta like advaita vedanta non dual vedanta which we are speaking about which say the world is false and there's a big quarrel about it is the world real or false is it a reality in itself or is it an appearance really speaking that question is misguided sri ramakrishna was asked once that uh, um is the world false like advaita vedanta would have it uh, would would say um sri ramakrishna said why should the world be false that is a step in vedantic enquiry in bengali he said bicharer katha in the step in vedantic enquiry now what is so it's a very nuanced reply he did not say the world is not false it's real he didn't say that he didn't say of course the world is false he said no when you say the world is false he knows what's in the mind of the person who's asking the person is asking from an advaitic perspective non dual perspective see that's a step in non dual enquiry bicharer katha in bengali he said but that's not remarkable also sri ramakrishna's observation that's a bicharer katha it's not remarkable because uh, advaita itself advaitic texts like the panchadashi a classic of post shankar advaita they also say the world is false and i'll tell you exactly what they say vidyarnya swami the author of the text panchadashi he says what is the status of the world is it real or is it false and who is saying this a follower of adi shankara acharya committed non dualist the author of the non dual classic panchadashi he says that um, this world he says to the to the ordinary man in the street you know he says vastavi it's absolutely real it can't be ignored it's real vastavi means vastu real to the philosopher to the enquirer he says it is anirvachaniya it cannot be classified as real ultimately or as unreal that is the definition of falsity something that appears to us like the rope like the snake in the rope it appears to us like the water in the mirage it appears to us but it's not real in itself there's no real water in the mirage there's no real snake when you when when it's actually a rope so something that appears but does not exist you can't deny that it appeared to you for a moment you thought it was something else so that's called falsity it's like a lie uh, somebody tells a lie uh, it's not the truth but it's not nothing either it didn't keep quiet see there are three things telling the truth and keeping quiet and telling a lie so when somebody tells a lie the person did say something it's not nothing but it's not the truth similarly falsity is when we experience the reality as something other than what it is so we experience the rope as a snake it's not you're not experiencing a rope as a rope you experiencing the desert not as a desert but as an oasis full of water that's a mirage uh, so panchadashi the author of panchadashi vidyaranya swami says when you enquire with logic when you reason you will come to this conclusion that the world is an appearance it's not nothing but it's not the ultimate truth you can't say it's nothing because it appears to you you experience it all the time but you can't say it's the ultimate truth which is pure consciousness existence whatever you call it and then he goes on to say this uh, author of panchadashi to the enlightened one so three views the worldly man's view the philosopher's view and the enlightened one's view to the enlightened one he says there is no world there is brahman alone there is only one non dual reality just like that swami told me why should it be two it's only one because i had asked that swami is it that you see the enlightened one sees uh, absolute reality existence consciousness bliss and this world like a shadow sort of hanging around you know <laughs> and he said no no it's not like that it's one and the one is brahman or that absolute reality um so let's see three answers to the question is the world real to the man on the street yes the world is real vastav it's true to the person in a dream whatever he is experiencing in the dream doesn't know it's a dream it's real it, it's practically it's it's what is being experienced but when you inquire into it it's neither real nor non-existing 
it's what is called false. Uh, and for the fully enlightened one, it's Brahman. Brahman alone exists. There's no separate reality called the world. And that's what exactly Sri Ramakrishna said. When Sri Ramakrishna was asked, is this world false? He said, why should it be false? That falsity of the world uh, is a stage in inquiry. That philosophical inquiry when you do vichara, you come to this conclusion, the world cannot be determined as absolutely real or as completely unreal. So what is being said here is, Purnat Purna Mudachyati, if you literally translate, it means from the full, this fullness has come. But if you look a little deeper, that is being called, the cause is being called Purnam, and the effect is also being called Purnam, effectively denying that there is any cause and effect, that really nothing has happened. It seems to have happened that way, that the world seems to have appeared before you, something has been produced, but actually it is the same reality. Purnam. In which case, what is being said here? What's being said here is, whatever we are experiencing, wherever we are, worldly, spiritual, in whatever sense, whichever religion we belong to, whatever we are experiencing, the dramatic claim is, you are experiencing nothing but God. Swami Vivekananda said, never approach anything except as God. Because um, that's the fact. The fact is that there's only one non-dual reality. If Advaita Vedanta is true, in that case, whatever is real must be that one reality because it's non-dual, no, no second reality. If there are multiple realities, maybe, right, I'm experiencing a reality called a world and there is some other reality called God, heaven, something else. But if it is non-dual, Advaita, then whatever we are experiencing must be that non-dual reality. What, in other words, whatever we are experiencing in the language of religion must be God. It's a very, why it is profound, it's a very capacious idea of the ultimate reality. What do I mean by that is, what this Purnamada Purnamidam is saying is, if it is, if it is, formless and it cannot be with form it's an incomplete god if it is with form and you deny that it can ever be formless it's an incomplete god if you say it is with form but it only has to be god has to be a male form it's an incomplete god always shiva goes with shakti and shakti you cannot say it is only shakti there's always shiva in the background if it's only female, then it's an incomplete God. If it's only to be worshipped in a form which is um, with a human form, it's an incomplete God. That's why in Sanatana Dharma, in uh, Hinduism, you have uh, um, God being worshipped as a fish, the Matsya Avatara, uh, as the tortoise, the, <laughs> the Kurma Avatara, as the man lion in the human form in the male form, in the female form, in the male and female form together, Ardhanarishwara, and with no form, formless. But the idea always is, if you say it is only formless, then it's an incomplete uh, God. Then comes the Muslim or the Christian and says, well, God is formless, and these Hindus have got it wrong. Smash these uh, images and destroy the temples. No, it's an incomplete idea of God, you have got it leads to fanaticism, it leads to uh, hatred, it leads to violence. It is what is called in Vedanta, uh, in, in yoga also, Raga Dvesha, likes and dislikes. Strong likes and dislikes. See, what is the problem with strong likes and dislikes? Practically it's alright, people can have preferences, will automatically have preferences. However, deep within, we should not hold on to these preferences as ultimately true. Because, if it is a non-dual reality, then whatever we are experiencing, whether we prefer it, whether we don't prefer it, whether we love it or whether we hate it, it must be the same reality. The same Brahman in our friends and in what we consider to be our enemies. Uh, in uh, people like us and in what we see as people different from us. In human beings and in non-human beings. In living beings and in non-living things. It must be the same background reality somewhere. Otherwise, non-duality cannot be true. 
when we have this idea of non-duality, it translates into Purnam. And that is what you see, um, in, you know, if you look at the enormous breadth and richness of the Sanatana Dharma of Hinduism. The non-dualistic schools, dualistic schools, Vishishta, Dvaita, Dvaita, all the different schools. How can it be such extraordinary variety can happily coexist with each other? Even a lot of Hindus don't understand this. So there have been occasionally um, you know, reform schools. No, 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 we must not worship uh, images. And therefore, let's have a reformed Hinduism without image worship. And there were reform movements always. That's all right. Hinduism is fine with that too. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna came up as, as a bulwark against this silliness. He comes and quite unapologetically, he goes and worships an image. And the image of Kali, Bhavatarini Kali, in Dakshineshwar. And reaches enlightenment, not just enlightenment. The range and breadth of his spiritual experiences is unparalleled in, in the history of spirituality. Show me one other instance of such extraordinary samadhis, of such extraordinary mystical experiences, of such extraordinarily universe, universal teachings. No. You, uh, you cannot find another example like that. That's why Vivekananda said, if image worship can, can produce one like Ramakrishna, worship a thousand images, I say. <laughs> so Purnam, um, a, a capacious idea of the divine. If the divine is worshipped as Shiva, the male form, as a Parvati or Durga, or Kali and uh, you know, Lakshmi in the female form, in, as Ganesha, if your God cannot be an elephant-headed God, it's an incomplete God. But if your God is only the elephant-headed God, it's also an incomplete God. <laughs> so where does this extraordinarily capacious idea of divinity come from? From Purnam. It includes all of it. Last time we did Buddhism and you can say this sounds very different from it. That sounds very minimal. Extraordinarily logical and minimal, philosophically austere. This sounds very maximal, inclusive of anything and everything. <laughs> what this does is, it frees us from raga dvesha, from, um, from thinking that this alone must be right and that cannot be right. It frees us from fanaticism. It frees us from thinking that only Sri Ramakrishna, when he, one thing he did not like at all, he would say again and again, in Bengali, he said, Matuar Buddhi, dogmatic attitude. He said, never set a limit to what God can be. Never set a limit to the infinitude of that ultimate reality. That comes from this uh, Purnam. Mm -hmm. The fullness of what is experienced here and there. In the cause and in the effect. It's the same reality. All right, I still haven't started. Now I'm going to... <laughs> If you ask those great uh, philosophers, Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, if you gave them this Purnam idea, what would they say? They would smile tolerantly and would say, that's cute, but it doesn't stand to reason. You must establish it on the basis of reason and experience. So that's what Advaita Vedanta sets out to do. This vision was there. In the Vedas itself, this vision was there of this Purnam. This Purnamada, Purnamidam comes from the Vedas. But how do you um, make it a logical philosophy, a, a logical worldview or God view, whatever you call it? And how do you experience it, make it part of your living, um, you know, your, your lived life? So here, here goes. Advaita Vedanta, I'll take the uh, Advaitic philosophy, which establishes this Purnam. Um, it says, the, the unique thing about Advaita Vedanta is that it's not a philosophy or spiritual path which, um, uh, which says that there's something else to be attained. What you get in Advaita Vedanta is what you have al always had. Something, and what you remove in Advaita Vedanta is something that was never there. Now, I always say it sounds like a con job. <laughs> yeah? and there was this snake oil salesman 
in the wild west wild wild west and he was arrested and brought before the magistrate by the sheriff on charges of uh, uh, offering cures to non-existent diseases and uh, you know uh, uh, real cures to uh, imaginary diseases and imaginary cures to real diseases so <laughs> advaita vedanta sounds like that when it says what will you get after all of this you will get what you always had and what will you remove what will you get rid of what will you improve after all of this said so what was never there <laughs> that's what you're going to get rid of in in sanskrit this is called praptasya prapti nivrittasya nivritti but they mean it praptasya prapti means attaining what is already attained nivritti nivrittasya nivritti means removing negating curing something that was never there <laughs> but what does it mean then it is because of our ignorance what is already attained what was always there seems to be not there uh, advaita vedanta says you are brahman you are not this body not this mind you are limitless existence consciousness bliss and you are that right now whether you know it or not whether you believe it or not whether you you, do, you think you are experiencing it or not advaita vedanta says it's right there it's already attained it's just because of ignorance it feels like no i don't know this i don't experience this I don't see this. I've told you sometimes about this uh, class I used to attend of Ashtavakra Samhita from a great teacher uh, in the Himalayas um, in Gangotri. And sometimes teaching us this doctrine this this teaching he would say he would look at us and he would say oh monks whether you believe it or not whether you experience it or not the truth is you are Rama तुम जानो या ना जानो मानो या ना मानो तुम ही राम योर राम मीन्स योर गाड योर वन विथ गाड एंड वट डज इट रिमूव संसार आई एम हियर इन स्पिरिचुअल लाइफ बिकॉज आई एम सफरिंग लाइक द बुद्ध सेट देर इज सफरिंग फर्स्ट नोबल ट्रूथ एंड दैट हैज टू बी रिमूव आई एम सफरिंग आई एम गोइंग थ्रू बर्थ आई एम अफ्रेड ऑफ बर्थ एंड डेथ दिस साइकिल ऑफ बर्थ एंड डेथ आई एम टेरेबली अफ्रेड ऑफ डेथ i'm afraid of old age and sickness i'm afraid of uh, financial ruin and i'm i'm suffering from the miserable behavior of others or from generally the suffering of humanity and other living beings in this world there is so much suffering here i'm suffering and spirituality promises to take me beyond suffering every religious uh, path gives you a solution in this way you will go beyond suffering you know in samadhi or by going to heaven or something like that uh, and uh, the uh, uh, advaitic path tells you that yes this suffering actually what you're thinking it's always removed you are beyond suffering it's because of ignorance that you think that you are in suffering all right so this sounds very uh, crazy it sounds cool i think americans will love it it <laughs> sounds kind of counterintuitive um but how do we make sense of it how do we make sense of the fact that right here right now i am that absolute truth and i am beyond suffering and so are we all mm-hmm. so advaita vedanta starts with experience not extraordinary experience not mystical experience see the uh, the trick there is that y- y- someone might promise all of this can be experienced you don't have to believe it but how do you experience it well you put in the hard work of 40 years of meditation and then maybe you'll experience it if you don't better luck next life that is no good Advaita Vedanta says what we are talking about is right now it is being experienced now but you don't recognize it you know what it's like um if if you know jim is here and i don't know who jim is and i'm looking at him and somebody introduces that's jim i say oh i see now i get it that's jim did i see somebody new no i was already looking at him but i just recognized that this is jim Advaita Vedanta is like that. It brings us to see what is already there, but we never saw it earlier. The beautiful story of the the washerman's diamond. The washerman found a diamond, but he didn't know what what the diamond was. He just thought it's a rock. It's an odd-looking rock. And in India, you know, washermen they will take your laundry out to the river bank and they will slam it on the rocks and <laughs> they'll wash it. They'll get it clean, but you'll be horrified at what they do to the, to the fabric. and then they'll scrub it clean and they use that rock so he used to use this diamond to scrub dirty clothes and he didn't know this was he had got something that could remove all his poverty and but he was curious this rock is different from all other rocks so he let me ask my friend the vegetable seller 
And the vegetable seller was a little more um, thoughtful than the washerman, and he said, well, you know, this rock, uh, it sounds, it, it's pretty, so I'll give you um, and a bag of brinjals for it. The washerman did not sell it. He took it to somebody else who knew a little more. Finally, he took it to a diamond merchant. And the diamond merchant said, this is a magnificent diamond. I'll give, give you millions of rupees for it. And so all the washerman's needs were removed. His poverty was gone forever. Now, that's a parable. The parable points to the fact that we already have the rock. But like the washerman, we don't know that it's a diamond. And Advaita Vedanta is like the diamond merchant who wants to introduce us to it so that all our problems are solved immediately. So what is this rock which we all have already, right now? It is experience. In Sanskrit, Anubhava. What experience? All experience. Any experience. All right, right now I'm going to begin. <laughs> Introducing us to the rock. So follow closely. Experience, when we look at our experience, which experience? All experience. Notice one thing about experience. All experience has this, this structure. In every experience you find, I am the subject and this is the object. Subject and object. Look around, right now, all the time. And right now, I am the subject. Take it in a very naive way. Don't be too non-dualistic and... <laughs> Yeah. Just in a very straightforward way. Here I am. I'm the subject. And here is the object. The objective universe. I can see people. I can see chairs and you know, the hall. I can see the road and the trees outside and the sunlight. All of that. And I can only not, not only see, I can hear and smell and taste and touch. This is, uh, I am the subject and I'm experiencing the object. What else appears to me? You know, without, before doing any Vedanta. Just common sense. I, the subject, seem to be this body. It is instinctive. I am this body. And uh, it seems to me this world of objects is continuously changing. I am sort of unchanging because I have been there since my childhood, as far as I remember, from babyhood. And um, I guess I will live for some more time. So although I am unchanging, see the paradox of it. Although I feel I am the same one, uh, but I feel I'm going to die. And this world is continuously changing, but I feel this will go on. It existed before me and it will continue to, continue to exist after me. Huh? Right? That's what we feel instinctively. I'm going to die. And not only that, I am dependent on this world of objects for everything. For my pleasure, for my entertainment, for my very sustenance. The world provides me with food without which I would die. The world provides me with, uh, with air without which I would suffocate in a minute. The world provides me with uh, shelter and with, with friends and with, uh, with knowledge, with entertainment. When I'm bored, there is, there is the TV or the internet. When I want to study, there are books. Everything that is good, worthwhile and gives me happiness is provided from to, by the world. Or at least, even if it's not provided, often it's withheld. <laughs> and I am dependent on the world for all my happiness. True. On the other hand, the world also provides me with a lot of suffering. There is um, disease and pain which the world can, can inflict upon me. And there is uh, physical pain, emotional pain inflicted by the behavior of other people and what's going on in the world. Uh, all my suffering seems to be caused by the object. And all possibility of happen uh, happiness and nice, you know, pleasant is the object. I'm dependent helplessly upon the object. And very soon I'll be crushed out of existence. Dead. This is what appears to me in, in experience. Now bring Vedanta into play. Vedanta introduces, the first thing it introduces is a simple observation. You are the subject, right? Yes. And you experience, right? Yeah. And what do you experience? The object. That's true. Notice that the subject and the object cannot be the same thing. Object is what you experience and subject is you the experiencer. Notice also consciousness or awareness is always on the side of the subject. I, the subject, am conscious of what? Of the object and of also myself. 
So consciousness is on my side. You might say, why not? Why can't consciousness be on the object side? After all, there are so many conscious beings. But notice, when we look at the object, whatever we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, they are objects, but not consciousness. I can see you. I can see your body. I can hear your voice. I can see your behavior. If I'm a telepath, I can look into your mind and see your thoughts also, or experience your thoughts, but I can never objectify your consciousness, your awareness. So the subject is that which experiences and is separate from the object. And the subject is also conscious. The object, consciousness is never object. It is always the subject. Now if we apply that, then we see something remarkable happening. The first result which emerges from it is, when we look at ourselves, the subject, we notice what seemed, what seemed instinctive to us, that I am the subject. Where is the subject? Here. But then here, this body, am I not aware of the body? Yes, I am. And the principle is, whatever you are aware of is an object. And you are the subject which is awareness. Or at least awareness is, part, is, is on your side. So if I'm aware of the body, the body by definition must be an object. Like this. Uh, this like the clothes that I'm wearing. Object. Then in this case, this body. It is an object. In fact, it's an object to all my senses. I can see it. I can touch it. I can smell it. Taste it. Even hear, the, hear it, you know, the sounds of the heartbeat or the, your tummy rumbling. All my five senses objectify the body. The body, I am begin to discover, is an object. Just like things out there, it's a thing. It's a remarkable thing. It's an extraordinary biological machine. But it's still a thing. And anything that is an object to, my, to consciousness, uh, is it cannot be the subject. Till now I thought, I the subject, I am this one. But I re now realize this is the world of objects and part of it is the body. And that's common sense. You don't need Vedanta for it. It's just a little bit of reflection shows, yes, just as this body is an object to my doctor, the doctor who prods it and probes it and scans it and tests it, it's an object. It's a biological living object. For me also it's a biological living object. It may be the vehicle I'm embodied in right now, but still it's an object. And to me the consciousness, quite palpably so. In that case, I am not literally the body. The body is there, I'm not denying it. I seem to be embodied in this body. I seem to be you know, in close proximity with this body. It's there. But I am not literally it. Not only that, if I am this conscious subject, I, my experiences go on without the experience of the body. Let me repeat that. My experiences go on. For example, in dreams. When I fall asleep, the body is there on the bed and sleeping. I still continue to have experiences. My dreams, pleasant dreams, nightmares, all of that continues and no, no part of the dream is the body sleeping on the bed. I've completely forgotten it. What am I saying? Our conscious experience as subjects can go on without reference to this physical body. That's all I'm saying. That also goes to reinforce the idea that I, as a conscious subject, am not literally the body. My conscious experiences can go on without experiencing the body. You might say, wait, just a minute, you're pulling a fast one. Because after all, you, the conscious being, this conscious subject, is being generated by the body. The body is the reality and the body, uh, the brain and the nervous system are generating you, the so-called subject consciousness, which is dreaming. So you, you actually don't exist uh, apart from the body. You are not a separate reality apart from the body. You are just something that's an epiphenomenon, a product of the body, processes in the body. But that's not established at all. Uh, forget Vedanta. Even in hard science, that's what's called the hard problem of consciousness. You have that right now there is just simply no way of reducing our first person experience as subjects, as consciousness, to the processes in the brain. That's the whole issue, the hot topic in consciousness studies. So we will go with this. I am consciousness. I continue to exist in dreams also without reference to the body. So I cannot literally be the body. Even further, even our minds, they are also objects. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, memories. All of them I experience. If I experience them, then it's an object. 
I am the experiencing consciousness. This distinction between mind and consciousness pretty much um, under, well understood in Buddhism, Sankhya, Yoga, Advaita, not understood in modern uh, uh, consciousness studies. Still, if you ask a person in consciousness studies, what is it that you are studying? They will give a vague answer like consciousness, mind, emotion, ideas, memories, perceptions, all of that together. But no, no. Now we have this analytic knife to distinguish between consciousness and the mental objects, thoughts, emotions, ideas. In fact, what we consider to be our personality. A you know, person might say that, I really literally don't think I'm a bundle of flesh and blood, but I'm a person. I have a personal history, I have thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas. This is who I am. But all those thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas are also objects. Some of them were not there a little while ago. Some of them have come up in your awareness now. Some of them will fade away over years. So you continue. What is you that continues? It can't be a thought. Thoughts are, they come and go just like that. It can't be a memory. They arise and fade away. It can't be a bundle of memories also. You are that bare consciousness which continues through the arising and disappearing uh, of thoughts and emotions and ideas. So I am not even the mind. The mind is there, the person is there, but I am the consciousness which is dressed in the mind, and dressed in the person and dressed in the body. Vedanta gives a rather subtle, um, uh, you know, little, little bit of reasoning to prove this. It says that um, in deep sleep, as we go from dreams to deep sleep, do you still exist or not? Now one person, uh, one might say, I don't exist. In deep sleep, it's nothing. It's just I'm not there. But then you'd be put in a very strange position of saying that every, if I don't exist in deep sleep, and I can, cannot deny that there is a phenomenon called deep sleep, then in that case, every time I wake up, I'm created anew. I pop out of existence when I fall asleep and I pop into existence when I wake up. It's very strange. Yeah. I, nobody will accept that. It's against common sense. It's against law. Law says that you, the one who went to sleep and the one who woke up is one and the same person. Continue to exist. It's much better to say that you know, there's some kind of sleep mode like computers have. So we went into a kind of hibernation, no activity, no, con uh, no experience of objects, uh, but you existed. And if you are that consciousness, you existed. Advaita puts forward an interesting proposition. What happens in deep sleep, general anesthesia, coma, is that you continue to exist completely unaffected as this pure awareness, but no object is presented to you. It's like light, light in deep space. If you look at deep space it, lo space, it looks dark. But it's full of light streaming from the sun. It's only when there's some object to reflect that light, suddenly you see something flashing and shining, like a comet racing through the solar system. You can see the brilliant display of the tail of the comet. But the comet doesn't come with its internal lighting. It's just light from the sun which is being reflected by the tail of the comet. And you see the brilliant display there. Similarly, if all objects are removed, there's nothing to see outside for because you're fallen asleep, you're not seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, not even aware of the body, not even dreaming, deep sleep, no physical objects, no mental objects, just blank, that's deep sleep. That doesn't mean consciousness is gone. So Advaita says in deep sleep is not an absence of consciousness, it's a consciousness of absence. It's not that awareness is gone, but you are aware of only blankness and absence. What comes out when you wake up is just the appearance of these objects. So therefore, I am not even the mind, because I continue as consciousness when the mind is gone, in deep sleep, anesthesia, coma. So this one consciousness, which experiences through the mind and body, the physical body and the external objects, through the mind, dream objects, mental objects, and when mind and body are not appearing, just the absence of the mind and body, this one continuous consciousness, can it die? So what changes and dies? Objects, all the time, by our own experience. But consciousness itself, can it die? 
if it was generated by the brain it could die because the brain will be will die after some time in the death of the body but if you say it cannot be generated by the brain heart problem you know care of the heart problem of consciousness how will it die it requires change but consciousness itself is unchanging you say are you are we supposed to believe that consciousness seems to be changing all the time uh, and early in the morning I, i'm a little sleepy and then i have a cup of coffee and then i'm more conscious well vedanta would say what was sleepy was the mind and what became more more sharp and alert is the mind after a cup of coffee not consciousness itself consciousness revealed you as the sleepy mind consciousness revealed the uh, alert mind consciousness was not um, sleepy or alert it was shining self same shining consciousness there is a logical reason why i am saying that consciousness cannot change why if it changes and you can speak about it you can describe it anything that you can speak about describe observe is an object to consciousness then the change must be in the object not in consciousness if it was in consciousness it could not be objectified but you one might say that all right consciousness let consciousness change but we cannot see it uh, you can we cannot experience it then why talk of it at all that which can never be known why postulate it so uh, there is this reasoning which shows that consciousness logically cannot change pure consciousness bare awareness cannot change change is that which appears to consciousness the object changes the limited things changes the world of objects continuously changes that's why we have the intuit intuitive feeling even when we are not doing vedanta we have this intuitive feeling i am the same one from babyhood to teenage to middle age to old age somehow i am the same one you have this intuitive feeling uh, so uh, co- if its consciousness cannot change how can it die how can it die in vedanta consciousness is said to be unborn and undying if i am unborn and undying i have no fear of death i the consciousness have no fear of death remember what we felt like earlier i am entirely dependent on the world for all the goodies and i'm scared of the world for all the baddies which come from the world now this one consciousness think of this consciousness do a mental exper- experiment now without reference to the world you're not seeing anything hearing anything smelling tasting touching anything you're not aware of the body imagine in deep sleep you're not thinking anything you're not remembering anything suppose all memories of your personality have been erased you've left it aside no awareness of the external world no memories no thoughts no sense of i even just the bare awareness this bare awareness what does it want what does it want as you say nothing uh, are you with me some of you we can you are you're following it wants nothing because wanting comes with the activity of the mind right what does it or whom does it hate nothing what does it expect what is its guilt sorrow regret nothing that comes with the activity of the mind what is it waiting for what uh, god to appear what samadhi to be attained uh, what enlightenment event what is it waiting for nothing it is deathless it is beyond desire is beyond suffering beyond wanting it is timeless because time becomes obvious only when the mind starts working space becomes obvious only when the senses start working you see even when advaita vedanta says brahman is all pervading this already accepting space you have accepted space then you say it's all pervading when brahman is eternal and would this have a great objection to that that something is eternal but that's only after you have accepted time then you find the division between all objects are changing continuously so brahman must be eternal but even time and space are appearances in in consciousness thanks to the mind this one consciousness it is deathless it's birthless it is complete in itself it does not want anything at all 
does it want enlightenment this consciousness itself no some of you are not confident <laughs> if you think about it just your thought experiment you will say no if if it's something like that is there it will not want enlightenment and if i am that i don't want enlightenment and this one consciousness someone might say yes but that's a very kind of abstract thing no world no body no mind and then there's some bare awareness is not our usual worldly experience but wait a minute right now what you call the usual worldly experience is that awareness there here now think about it this way are you aware right now you'll all say yeah we are aware we are seeing you how do you know we are having experiences we are seeing you all right close your eyes you're not seeing me anymore you're not seeing anything anymore are you still aware what do you think i can't hear see your response you have to say yes yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> i'm still aware and similarly if i plug my ears you know in a sensory deprivation tank i i don't see anything hear smell taste touch anything would i still be aware yeah i'd still be aware i'd be thinking when is this going to end <laughs> <laughs> and if i stop thinking there no thoughts no memories no ideas no desires would i still be there would that awareness would be there logically yes because those are objects if i drop them why would the subject disappear but it's not experiencing anything but it's still awareness is there even if i drop the sense of i the awareness just drop that also the awareness would still continue and that awareness which is there in the absence of world body mind is also there right now in fact if you don't see you still exist as awareness if you don't think you still exist as awareness but suppose just thought experiment suppose that awareness itself were not there would you be able to see the experience of seeing that consciousness that awareness if it were not there be bold just think look at your experience i the awareness shining i'm aware of thoughts through the thoughts i'm aware of the body mind through the body mind i'm aware of this uh, external world if i the awareness were not there would this experience of seeing be possible no would the experience of hearing smelling tasting touching be possible no would the experience of thinking experience of um, you know the spiritual quest would any experience be possible if i the awareness were not there no so this awareness because of this we are constantly having all these experiences and forgetting the nature of this awareness we are only using it for all these experiences we are using a diamond to scrub dirty laundry we are using it for seeing hearing smelling tasting we are using it for ambition and greed and fighting and hating we are using it for suffering and we are using it for a spiritual quest to take us beyond suffering but this awareness in itself is beyond suffering already even in the midst of seeing hearing smelling tasting touching it's beyond suffering what suffers this awareness for getting its real nature in alliance with the mind and the senses and one body becomes a suffering living being sentient being the awareness recognizing its own nature with the help of the mind how do you recognize with the help of the mind recognizing its own nature in the midst of hearing smelling tasting talking living you know doing whatever has to be done in life is free of suffering if i identify myself if i note that i am that bare awareness no matter what happens i'm actually free of suffering in the midst of suffering also yeah. sri rama krishna an example famous example dying of throat cancer and his disciple uh, hari swami turiyananda comes young boy comes at the and says uh, how are you today sir and sri ramakrishna says oh it hurts i cannot eat and this young man for some reason says to him but sir i see that you are in great delight apni anand de achen the cruel thing to say to a cancer patient sri ramakrishna <laughs> bursts out laughing and says oh the rascal has found me out <laughs> he is he admits that this boy is right i am in great bliss now was he acting that he is in pain and he cannot eat is is it um his play acting no no it's true just like any cancer patient suffers he suffered but like most cancer patients do not have this insight which 
in the midst of suffering gives, it, gives him this oasis of peace. That I am in my real nature as awareness, which is not an object, which illumines all objects, including this painful object of a cancer and um, in a tumor and a dying body. I am all right. I was before this appearance of this uh, cancer, cancerous tumor, and I'll be there after this, uh, this cancerous tumor disappears and the body disappears. I'm in the middle of that also. In the middle of this appearance also, I'm fine. And it's not just Sri Ramakrishna. All of us, we have that diamond right now, which takes us beyond suffering, which is, which is itself beyond suffering. Which makes possible, however, the experience of suffering. If that awareness were not there, would you experience suffering? No. You would not experience anything. So experience of pleasure, experience of pain, experience of bondage, experience of liberation. All of them, samsara and liberation, moksha, appear and disappear in that, that same field of awareness. And that awareness you are. You say, oh, this is great. Advaita Vedanta, wonderful. What I just quoted now is literally a line from Mahayana Buddhism. Samsara and Nirvana both are phenomena appearing in that limitless, you know, clear light of the void. You see? How it seems to come together. One more step is necessary. So it, right now it seems I have isolated myself as pure awareness. I investigated the subject, the seer, the experiencer in Sanskrit, drashta, and I've separated myself from the drishya. This world, I am the subject, pure awareness, the world appears to me. And I am just this awareness, bare awareness. But then one might ask, first, what is this world then? What is its relationship to you, the awareness? And how is this non-duality? This seems like complete duality. Awareness and a world of objects. Right? That's what we have achieved so far. No non-duality so far. This is Sankhya philosophy, a Sankhya dualism. The world of objects and this awareness. Now, Advaita Vedanta comes and says, Tattvam Asi, the reality which appears as this world of objects and the reality, this awareness which you are, they are one and the same reality. Huh? The that which appears as this universe is called Brahman. That which appears as you, this awareness, is called Atman. And Advaita Vedanta says, Atman is Brahman. That's the conclusion. You are that. Atman is Brahman. In that book, Jim Holt's book, um, Why Does the World Exist? This is not an inquiry into oneself. It's an inquiry into this universe. And there he goes around asking, you know, um, philosophers, nuclear physicists, um, this um, cos cosmologists like Roger Penrose, uh, mathematicians, computer scientists, uh, people of religion, theologians. Why does this world exist? And towards the end of that book, uh, he asks a famous American philosopher who passed recently, Robert Nozick. Robert Nozick. And he asks, um, so same question. And after some discussion, the philosopher seems to sort of metaphorically throw up his hands and says, who knows, maybe the Hindus are right, Atman is Brahman. <laughs> so Advaita Vedanta comes in and says, no, no, that material reality is not apart from you. Because Atman is Brahman, what you found as that bare awareness, yourself as this limitless awareness. And what is it is experiencing as this world of objects, whose reality is Brahman. They are not two. Atman is Brahman. Sam Altman, chat GPT, he also said that. Atman, <laughs> somebody asked him that, uh, um, tell us something that you believe which most people don't know or don't believe. And he said, Atman is Brahman. <laughs> How does that solve our problem, establish non-duality? Here is it. Um, as one great master said in Hindi, he said, Ye to thik hai ki drashta drishya se alag hai. Lekin kabhi socha hai, drishya kya drashta se alag hai. What does it mean? It is true. Consciousness is distinct and apart from all the objects. You are awareness distinct and apart from all this world of objects, changing objects, including body and mind. But have you ever thought, consider this thought, is this world of objects, yeah. sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, physical body, mind, is this world of objects distinct from you? You are distinct from all of this, but is it distinct from you? What does it mean? 
See, when usually two things are distinct, one thing is distinct from the other, the second one must be distinct from the first. So, for example, this microphone is distinct from this cloth. So cloth is also distinct from the microphone. They are two separate things. How do you know? One good way of saying is, can you experience one in the absence of the other? Can you experience the microphone in absence of the cloth? Yes. Can you experience the cloth in absence of the microphone? Yes. So they are separate things. But if there's something that you cannot experience in the absence of the other, you begin to think they may, be, may not be two distinct things. They seem different, but if one cannot be experienced without the other, then there must be some connection somewhere. So what? Now think about it. Objects appear to you in consciousness. You experience objects in consciousness. Consciousness can exist by itself, can appear, but it can, can uh, continue in the absence of objects like deep sleep, like coma, like samadhi. Consciousness can continue. But can objects be ever experienced without consciousness? What is the principle? Two things are separate if they can be experienced separately. Now I'm asking, can objects be experienced without consciousness? It's a trick question. The moment you say experienced, you're already building consciousness into that question. What is experience? Consciousness plus object. That's what we uh, <laughs> decided earlier. Objects can never be experienced in the absence of consciousness. In fact, the absence, absence of consciousness, according to Advaita Vedanta, is an impossibility. Objects always appear in con to consciousness in consciousness. And then Advaita Vedanta makes this remarkable claim, if objects cannot be experienced in the absence of consciousness, then the objects cannot be different from consciousness. Somehow, it must be consciousness itself experiencing itself as objects. As one monk put it, what's the nature of the eye? The nature of the eyes is to see. But when a little kid looks up into the sky, it's just empty space, there's no surface to be seen. He imagines, it seems to him, like an inverted blue bowl, like a surface which he's seeing. The eyes want to see, there's no space to be seen. And so, it looks like a surface, there's no surface to be seen. This empty space looks like a surface. He gives that example and says, consciousness alone exists according to Advaita Vedanta. The nature of consciousness is to experience. Look at our own uh, experience of life. The nature of consciousness is to experience. There's nothing else except consciousness to experience. And consciousness cannot be experienced as an object. So the great uh, conclusion is, these objects, so-called objects, are nothing but consciousness itself appearing to itself in that form. That you must give credit consciousness as an innate ability of consciousness, what the Buddhists call a magical display of the phenomena of samsara and nirvana. When in samsara struggling through spiritual life, you recognize the nature of reality as this limitless awareness, then the same samsara now appears to you as nirvana. Nagarjuna, thousands or two thousand years ago, he said there is no distinction between samsara and, and nirvana. That sounds stunning because the entire project of Buddhism is to go from samsara to nirvana. Now you're saying there's no distinction, but don't misunderstand. Yeah. It, it does not mean that the spiritual project is wrong. In fact, that's the only project that's worthwhile. But it ultimately you will see that which presents samsara to you, this world of objects, that when it's truly recognized, this very world of objects will, uh, samsara will seem like nirvana, will, will be nirvana to you. Yeah. Freedom. Because that consciousness, it neither requires samsara nor requires nirvana. It's always free. That's why Shankaracharya sings, Mano buddhya hankara chittani naham, the chidananda rupa shivoham. Then he says, Na dharmo, na chartho, na kamo, na moksha. I don't even want moksha, nirvana. Why? Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham because I'm of the nature of consciousness and bliss. I am Shiva. I am Shiva. That's why the consciousness itself does not want moksha. It's the uh, sentient being who feels that I'm caught in samsara. Moksha is not here at yet, as yet. I must struggle for moksha and nirvana and then attains to nirvana by realizing who am I, what am I and then sees this entire display as appearing in that consciousness, as nothing but that consciousness, then everything that we experience in this world, people, 
um, trees and you know animals, sky and earth and water and fire, all of that, and our internal universe of thoughts and emotions and ideas, good and bad, all of that is nothing but this one consciousness, uh, filling it through and through, Purnam. Everything that we encounter is this one limitless awareness. Our own nature, call Atman, Brahman, the Buddhists call it the clear light of the void. And this is appearing to us in all of these forms. And therefore, Purnamadah Purnamidam, that transcendent light is this world of subject and object. Right now, in our own experience. From that transcendent light, this world, Purnasya Purnam, uh, Purnat Purnamudachyate, from that fullness, this has arisen. What does it mean? In you, that limitless awareness, this world of objects, mind, body, and external world has arisen. Purnasya Purnamadaya, in this fullness, if you recognize all these objects are nothing but me, the pure light. Purnameva Vashishyate, light alone exists then. It, this limitless light alone exists. Now, um, I don't want to overburden, overuse this light metaphor because it can be misunderstood, grossly misunderstood. Somebody said to me that, okay, so we are all this light. So light is photons. Are we photons? I said, oh God, no, not in that sense. <laughs> it's a metaphor. I'm not, I don't mean that we're actually physical light there. <laughs> Uh, it, it's just bare awareness. That's what's compared to light. Because of the nature, it illumines everything and is self-revealing. This light illumines physical things and is self-revealing. In that sense, um, consciousness or awareness illumines everything and is self-revealing. Purnamadah Purnamidam. What seems very far away. Diamond. And it seems very different. This is a rock. Same thing. And it seems that from the rock a diamond has come. But it didn't. Because the rock and the diamond were the same. When does it seem? After realizing that it's a diamond. Oh, from the rock a diamond has arisen. It hasn't actually arisen. It was always that. Then, Purnasya, um, Purnamadaya. In the rock when you discover the diamond. Purnameva Vashishyate. The diamond alone remains. So this is a very profound subject. And I just want to leave us with this thought that um, in the end, if you have attended last week's talk, last week's talk, uh, uh, at the five schools, progressively deeper understanding of, none of them are wrong understandings. They are deeper and deeper understandings of the, uh, the teaching of emptiness. The last one, emptiness as the clear light of the void in which samsara and nirvana are appearing and disappearing, doesn't it sound remarkably similar to what we, the, the goal we have reached right now. Mm -hmm. I know there are serious objections on both sides. I have had um, Buddhist masters saying, no, 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 you can't conflate this with the Hindu Advaita view. That's wrong. That's an eternalism. There's one eternal reality called Brahman you're talking about. Not really, as we saw. Because the eternal only accepting time as a reality. But And on the Hindu side, they say, no, 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 no. You can't uh, conflate Purnam and Shunyam because Shunyam is just nothing, it's nihilism which is again un unfair because Nagarjuna 2000 years ago strongly says we are not talking about nothing does it exist? we say no does it not exist? we say no both exist and not exist? we say no neither exist nor does not exist? we say no Chatushkoti vinir mukta tattvam. The reality is beyond these four logical alternatives of the mind. The mind keeps playing within these uh, logical alternatives. The truth is beyond all these concepts. I got a call from a, a great traditional teacher of Vedanta from India, from uh, Banaras, in uh, alarm saying, Are you going to? In Bengali, he said, Shunno purno akkuradevanna ki. Will you make it one? What's going to happen in this talk? Are you going to say that Shunyam and Purnam are... Uh, in one sense, in a sort of ultimate sense, yes. Swami Saradanandaji, the biographer of Sri Ramakrishna, in Sri Ramakrishna, the great master, he writes, what they, the Buddhists, call Shunyam, it is what we call Purnam. We're talking about the same thing itself. Sri Ramakrishna, I'll let him have the last word. Very interesting last word. 
very Purnam type teacher, you know, who said in every path, whether you're worshipping God as mother like he did, or as the beloved Krishna, or as the Christ of the Christians, or as Allah of the Muslims, uh, in whichever way you, you do, it is the same reality. You can see the Purnam philosophy behind it. Once he was asked about the Buddha and emptiness. It's in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Somebody said to him, but the Buddha was a, a Nastik. A Nastik might mean two things. One is a non-believer in the Vedas, which he was. And the other one is not believing in some God or ultimate reality, which he was not. Um, Sri Ramakrishna immediately protested and said, why should he be a Nastik? He could not express in language what he had discovered. What he had discovered. He could not put it in language. Why could he not put it in language? Was his Sanskrit grammar faulty? <laughs> no. He was a very learned person. A very learned prince. He had gone through all the philosophies. And after giving up his kingdom and searching for you know, enlightenment. He had gone to all the existing masters and learned whatever they had to teach. So he knew all that. But what he had discovered finally could not be put in language. The moment you have language you have concepts. Language and concepts come together. And you try to put in that, you will be doing an injustice. So, Sri Ramakrishna said, but he didn't explain all this. He just said, he could not put in language what he had discovered. And I'm just reminded, you know, the Buddha's great silence when he was asked these questions. So I think 14 questions, he remained silent. There's a lot of discussion in Buddhist philosophy, why did he remain silent? Not because he didn't know the answers. He knew all the answers, but none of them were adequate. Why did he remain silent? Because the real answer cannot be put in language. And that's the beginning of the Madhyamaka philosophy of Nagarjuna. Who says if you clothe it in language and uh, concepts, it's bound to be wrong. And then comes the extraordinary statement of Sri Ramakrishna. He says, Osti nastir majhe sheikhane thik thik. In Bengali. That which is between is and is not. That's exactly right. Which is a very strange um, statement for a Hindu teacher to make. The Hindu teacher, beyond existence and non-existence, beyond the manifest and non-manifest, is Brahman. That language you find in the Upanishads, in the Gita, Nasat Nasat Bhagavad Gita, you find that language. But between, this between is a very peculiarly Buddhist uh, idiom. In fact, the very word Madhyamaka means between. It's neither the extreme of some existing God, Atman, Brahman, nor the ex extreme of nothingness. It's between. Madhyamaka. Literally, in, in anybody who knows Indian languages, it sounds immediately like middle. Madhyamaka. And here Sri Ramakrishna says, that's exactly right. This most Hindu of all teachers, this image worshipper, worshipper of Kali, this Purnam teacher, and he, he uses the word of the language of Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti and says that's exactly right. All right, we take it as as it is. <laughs> it's a an amazing journey and, uh, into emptiness last week and into fullness this week. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, Ma Sharada, Swami Vivekananda, to bless us with that vision, with that insight, which liberates us from samsara, where we can finally see samsara and nirvana or moksha as appearances. In our in the reality that we are, this limitless awareness. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu. Thank you very much. <laughs>